Hi, welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Eitan Berger. Sinai in Daba, held annually in Johannesburg, Cape Town and Durban, is a Torah convention led by the foremost international Jewish thinkers and leaders. A unity project of the Office of the Chief Rabbi, Sinai in Daba is built on three pillars, unite, inspire, discover. Simcha was privileged to attend the opening of the conference at the Cape Town International Convention Center. This is Sinai and Daba number five here in Cape Town. And in fact, this year for the first time, Sinai and Daba actually started in Cape Town and then moves to Durban and then on to, on to Johannesburg. Um, and the response here at the community has been really unbelievable. Record bookings and participation, and there's just such a wonderful vibe and an energy. And uh, it's, it's just something so special for all of us to be part of. I was in Harrods in London. I'm standing there, there's an upper crust English couple standing next to me. The guy actually was wearing a silk cravat. I've never seen that. No, silk cravat. And they're looking at some object d'art. He's surreptitiously glancing in my direction every now and again. And he says to his wife, he says, Harriet, and she says, yes, George. He says, oy vey. <laughs> this is quite expensive. <laughs> the oy vey was for me. <laughs> and the truth is, but this phenomenon of bageling, I think, also is similar to going to cricket. It is the desire of the human being, of the Jew, to unite with other Jews, to say that I am part of you, you're part of me, we are part of this one unit. It's a very deep-seated desire of the soul. Sinai and Dab is about choice, about offering people, different people are interested about different things, but it's also about a message which says that Torah applies to every part of life that um, Judaism has a message for every dimension of what it means to be a human being and, and every dimension of life, whether it's psychological, whether it's about history, whether it's about politics, whether it's about current affairs, what, whatever dimension of human existence, um, the Torah has a message and Sinai and Daba reflects the broadness of, uh, and the inspiration of, of what that is all about. The Garden of Eden was a female experience. The Garden of Eden was, a, was an experience of unity. There was just one androgynous being and God, there was just man and one woman, one man and one woman, and one of the blessings that we say under the chuppah is we ask God to give this man and woman who are standing under the chuppah the same joy and pleasure that they had in Gan Eden because the Gan Eden experience was an experience, was a circle experience of love and togetherness. But from that moment, when after the sin, we were sent out into a male world. If you look in the, in the first chapter of Genesis, and you see the, or actually it's in the second chapter, if you look at the curses, the punishments that God gave man, woman, and the snake, there's a tremendous amount there. You could spend hours learning it, but I just want to concentrate on one sentence. It's one of the sentences that my, my students in Israel love. It's their secular uh, Israeli university students, and I think there's even a book called this, and uh, it's a lovely sentence. And what does the sentence say? Eli sheikh teshukatech v'hu yim sholbach. God says to the woman, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. It's nice, no? Okay. Well, I think that a lot of people, when they uh, hear about gender, when they think about the woman's role in Judaism, it creates a lot of uh, antagonism because the feeling is that the man is always in the public role. He's always out there doing things. He's uh, He's the one that learns the Torah. He's the one that uh, is part of the minion. And very often women feel that they don't have a place in Judaism. What does it mean, he, your desire will be to him? The idea is like this, that the male world, the woman comes into the male world. And when I say woman here, I refer to anybody who relates to the value of the circle, not just women, right? But the woman in this world, she's constantly trying to pull him into the circle. She's constantly trying to tell him what's important is relationship, what's important is family. She's the one that fought for monogamy. She's the one that fights today for exclusivity. And Western society is built completely before the needs of the man. And it basically says to the woman, you're just gonna have to become more like a man. You're just gonna have to deal with it because this is a situation. So the woman is sent, or the, or the female persona is sent into this male world, and she's told, 
it's not going to be your world. But your job is to constantly pull humanity back into that circle. My work is based on more of a more Kabbalistically approach, a, a Kabbalistic approach to the whole thing. And um, what I want to maintain is that there's always two voices in Judaism. Judaism, there's always the female voice and the male voice. And the ultimate goal in Judaism is to create a synthesis between these two voices. My message of what it means to be a Jewish woman, or even what it is, means to be a Jew, is to remain faithful to that voice, to remain faithful to the voice of the circle. And if I had to give a message to the men in this room, I would say um, if, you have a, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a woman in your life, so uh, listen to her, because she has something very important to say. Now in its fifth year, Sinai in Darba has seen a procession of world-famous psychologists, filmmakers, academics, professors, historians, geopolitical experts, Torah scholars, Rosh Yeshivas, mystics and musicians captivate and enliven increasingly large crowds at South Africa's premier conference venues. Sinai and Darba strives to be relevant for people and, and to make um, the, the message of Judaism relevant to today. And people are interested in their own psychological health and understanding, spiritual identity, relationships with other people. These are very important issues for people in their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, I think that's, that's why so many people come to Sinai and Darba, because it addresses the issues that people are confronting in their day-to-day -day lives. In Kabbalah, there are two major emotional facets or directions, and those are chesed and gvura. And in the language of human relationships, we might call those love and respect. And sometimes when a relationship is suffering, when it's floundering, the adrenaline rush animalistic response is, oh, I need to throw more love into this relationship. I need to do something. When the truth is, the more spiritual response is often, you don't need more love in the relationship, you need more respect. You don't need more doing, you need more withholding. You need to make space, give room. So to have a real relationship, you have to treasure the different and let it broaden you and deepen you. And let the sameness, especially if it's good and it's holy, affirm what's good in you. So I'm going to conclude by telling you the instruction. The instruction is when you ever encounter anyone in marriage with your children, I repeat this, with your children and with strangers, there are two critical questions that will make it easy for you to have a relationship with somebody who's the same and someone who's different. What could I do to help you? And what could you teach me? And if you let them teach you, and if you're willing to give, you'll have a relationship in which there's love. That's what I'll conclude with. I wish you all the best. Today, we enjoy a higher standard of living than ever before in any generation ever in the history of the world. And materially speaking, we enjoy incredible progress. And one thing that's happened is we've abandoned the spiritual progress of previous generations. And we see that when you're raising a child, they can have all the comforts and all the, the luxuries in the world, but if they don't have meaning, they don't have a purpose, they don't think that their life matters in the grand scheme of things, that uh, all the material comforts in the world don't amount to anything. I want to share with you a practical tool that you can take home, and it is a prayer. It is based on there's something called the serenity prayer. It's not a Jewish prayer, but it's not from another religion. Um, and it goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. But that prayer is too long for me. Because when I'm being reactive, when I'm being a thermometer instead of a thermostat, and I am getting my buttons pushed and having a little princess in the pea syndrome, and being way too self-conscious instead of God conscious, and I need to get over myself and have a sense of humor, become human, embrace my humility, that prayer is so long that by the time I'm finished reciting it, a lot of damage can occur. 
So I wrote a kitsur, an abridged, a shortened version of the serenity prayer in Hebrew, which I will share with you right now, practical tool that you will leave with. You will actually have something you can use at home. Together, let's do serenity prayer in the language of your choice, but let's do it together. <laughs> One, two, three. <sighs> One, two, three. <sighs> and let us say, Amen. Thank you. What people are really looking for is living wisdom. That's what they're really looking for, living wisdom. Wisdom that can help them in their life today and tomorrow. But what Torah comes to provide is a living wisdom where there's an intersection between this incredibly deep system from an intellectual, psychological, spiritual point of view, but making it relevant day to day. Long ago, very long ago, I'm looking around the room, there may be some of you remember, there was a fellow named Art Linkletter. And he had a television program which was entitled Kids Say the Darndest Things. And he would go around interviewing little children, asking them questions, and it was amazing some of the answers that they would give. But there's one particular teaching that I'll always remember I learned from a little six or seven year old. Art Linkletter went around with his microphone and asked children this question. What's the most important thing your father can do for you? And one child said, the best thing my father could do for me would be to love my mother. What a powerful message. And it's such a powerful message in parenting. The energy and vibe of Sinai and Dharma is that it addresses things that are so important and relevant in people's lives. And it's also about the unity of the community. I think that people love Sinai and Daba because it is about the community coming together in a spirit of unity. It's just a, it's, it's a privilege to be part of. And that's one of the remarkable things that the speakers who come from all different parts of the world, they say what they find so inspiring about South African Jewry is the unity, the openness, the inclusiveness of this community. And that is something so inspiring and so special. In some respect, I think we maybe always thought that Jews connect to their Judaism through the synagogue via rabbi, and I think that's, that's changed somewhat. And there's something very special about that. There's a resonance that comes with just being in one place and exposed to Jewish learning and then sharing that with everybody. Thank you. Hello. I'm waiting to see, uh, I really want to see Yitzchak Dovid Grossman, you know, he's a, a hero and uh, you know, just someone who's so respected by every angle of, you know, Jewish life, whether from completely secular to completely Haredi, Yitzchak David Grossman is, uh, you know, a real, a really special person. Um, yeah, mind-blowing, mind-blowing human being. I grew up in Mea Shearim, very strong religious, Hasidim. After the Six-Day War, the first time that I come to the Kotel, Western Wall, I've been so excited, thankful for God, for the miracles, because in six days, Israel succeeds. I say to myself, what can I give back God, thankful for these miracles? I say, I will leave Yerushalayim. I will go to a place they need somebody to walk with the youngsters. Migdala Emek decided that I was there. In this time, it was the worst place in Israel. Crime, drugs, big problems. I decided to leave Yerushalayim and to go to this place. I come down, you know, I've been naive. I ask who is the yeshiva, who is this? They're looking at me, they don't understand what I speak. I say, who can I find the youngsters? I say in the disco. Started to go to the disco every night. I became the name in Israel, the disco rabbi. And they became a shock. A rabbi with a beard and payers comes in at the disco. What you're looking, they think somebody died. You look for me. At the end, I became very close with them. I became, I go every night into the disco, speaking to them, I give them a feeling. They come and started to come to me. They brought the friends, many from them involved in crime, in drugs. My home became a disco. And then little by little, me, me have a contact with the, with the boys. Then somebody tell me my brother's in jail. I go to the prison, first time I see a prison, hundreds of youngsters, I decided to make a program from rehabilitation in prison. 
Today, right now, we have more than 1,000 prisoners in, in their program. The government says that it's the best program. 70% don't go back to jail. Walking in the streets and walking in the, in, the, in, the, in the jails, many times when I sit with the prisoners or with the boys they involve in crime, when you sit them face to face, you see they have a heart, they have a feeling, and you think, what happened? I come the day in jail, day in crime. When you speak to them, you see the seichel. But when you look inside, you understand that they come from a broken home. They come from very hard atmosphere. They grew up in atmosphere from crime because this, they're behaving like this. But if you will take him, this boy and this girl in the time, let's say the age 9, 10, and give him love and give him education, they can be the best boys, the best girls. And this teach me that the only way to save these boys and the girls, to give them a home, to give them love, to give them caring. And from this idea, I built Migdal O with 18 boys. Today, we have more from 6,000 children only in, this, in, the, in the institutions, like a city for children. But through the war, through the work that I work with people, I see that every Jew has inside God. You only need to speak to him. This is my work day and night for 40 years. One of the great sages, Rabbi Destler, in the last hundred years, he talks about the most transformative act a person can do for their own life, for their own consciousness, is learn to become a giver and not a taker. Right? It's to learn not just a single action, but an attitude, a philosophy, a Welthanschung of giving, of chesed. And he says, at any given moment, a person basically falls into a duality. At any given moment, are you giving or are you taking? And in the goal of, of spiritual development, he says, if a person would simply focus on that duality and ask themselves at any given moment, am I giving or taking, that itself could create a, a massive, you know, is a massive catalyst for, for extraordinary change. And the assumption he's basically saying is the right kind of giving is invigorating, is empowering. You feel connected to something greater with love, right? And the wrong kind of giving is some kind of self-abuse. It's hurtful, it's depleting, it can destroy you, it can destroy your relationship. So what's the distinction? And the distinction is very profound that there's a giving which is truly a giving. And there's a giving that's a form of a taking. So sometimes we take as a form of giving. And sadly, sometimes we give, which is really a form of taking. I'm giving you this so that you'll adore me, you'll approve of me, you'll, 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 you'll feel I'm your savior because I need validation. So the true giving is when I give beyond myself. Giving beyond myself does not mean I deplete, I give to you till I get your adoration. It means I give from a place that goes higher than my need for adoration. And, and that, that is the concept of giving, the concept of chesed, the concept of unity, the concept of transcending self to bond and unite with another, to see another needs before I see my own. Why can't you stop the automatic thinking process? Does anyone know? You know? Why can't you stop thoughts? There are many thoughts that we can stop instantly. Those thoughts are called the bina, to be mit boinein. But makshavas are very hard to stop. The reason you can't stop machshavas is because they're actually triggered not intellectually, but by emotions themselves. In addition to enriching content and top caliber speakers, Sinai and Daba serves to bring together South African Jews of every persuasion, religious, secular, traditional, young and old, to celebrate, reaffirm and strengthen the moral vision and core values 
that form the very fabric of society in a spirit of warmth and unity. Today has indeed been a day of amazing inspiration. And we've drawn our inspiration from our spectacular guest speakers. I'm delighted to hand everybody over to our magnificent musicians who will help us serve Hashem with the greatest joy of their magnificent and inspiring music. The Sinai and Daba Fire has been mind-blowing. Great organization, great speakers, uplifting and great takeaway value. Thank you. It was amazing. Well done to Chief Rabbi Goldstein. It was amazing. Thank you. Woo! I've heard erudite speakers. I've heard a flow of words that's absolutely magnificent. I feel I've been absolutely inspired by today. The invitation to speak at Sinai and Daba is for me a great pleasure and a great privilege. Because of my South African connection, or even more important, my Litvak connection. More relatives of mine are buried in West Park than in any other cemetery in the world. So, and I, I feel at home, and it's as if I, it's as if I came to my family. I'm a member of Parliament from the Christian community and I think it's incredible for us to just learn from the Christian community our Judeo-Christian roots. I've just attended a meeting now on the rewriting of history and the fact of how the Holocaust has been denied in certain East European areas and that we as Christians need to stand up and stand for the truth that the Holocaust happened and that had we as Christians stood up stronger the Holocaust might not have happened. I'm just chasing sparks. I'm just chasing those ancient sparks. I absolutely love the one on meditation and so inspirational. I learned a lot from that. And if there's something that the world is looking for and that we have within our Torah, it is inspiration. And that inspiration doesn't have to be a one-off occasion. Sinai and Darby is spectacular. It's a moment of inspiration. But we need to find a way of taking that inspiration with us each and every single day. Thank you to everybody for making the magic of Sinai and Darby possible. God bless you and thank you. Sadly, that's all we have time for for this week's episode of Simcha. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you join us. If you'd like to be in touch, please find us on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions and drop us a line. From myself, Eitan Berger, and all of us here at Simcha, have a fantastic week and goodbye. <laughs>